Weapons in One Piece are absolutely underrated compared to Devil Fruits and Haki and such, but they're pretty incredibly strong. However, no weapon is stronger than the subscribe button for the Grand Line Review, which will allow you to wield regular One Piece content uploaded straight into your YouTube feed. In fact, it's almost too much power. Hello and welcome to the Grand Line Review, your source for everything One Piece, and today we're not so concerned with the characters or the world, and instead we're going to be highly focused on items, because I would like to delve into the strongest weapons in the series. And having said that, I guess we are kind of focused on characters because living weapons are indeed a thing, AKA Princess Shirohoshi, but you know, we'll get into that. Because it can be easy to overlook with all of the fist fights and devil fruit powers in One Piece, but weapons are actually a massive, massive aspect of this world. And there are some particularly powerful examples out there that should very much be feared by all. First up, I should say that in this discussion of the strongest weapons, I won't be considering chemical weapons like Caesar's various endeavors. And I can't say that I have any good reason for excluding them. I just don't think it's worth spending time on them over a lot of the more tactile weapons in the series. I also won't be classifying devil fruits as a type of weapon, which I know some people do, <laughs> crazy people. And also we talk about devil fruits more than enough elsewhere on this channel, so meh. But with that in mind, what are we looking at? Well, to begin our exploration into the glorious weapons of the One Piece world, we have no better place to start than the Mato Blades. Swords, wonderful, wonderful swords. So this is another one of those more background features of the series, as are all weapons really, but the One Piece world has a very rich history and law in regards to swordplay. So much so that there is even an established blade grading system, which begins with a very simple base level grade. And there's an unknown amount of blades in this particular category. And I suppose it is potentially limitless. But then when we take one step up to the skillful grade blades, we discover that there are only 50 in the entire world. And an example of the skillful grade category would be Yubashiri, Zoro's former companion, which was destroyed during any sobby by a rust dude. Then we move on to the great grade swords of which there are only 21 in the world, with most of the ones that we know of honestly having been owned by Zoro. In fact, he has held four of the five great great swords that we have experiences of, one of which would be his trademark Wadawichi Monji, the sword he inherited from Kuina. But right at the top is where the good stuff really is, which comes in the form of the supreme great swords, of which there are only 12, count them 12 in existence. One is owned by Dracul Mihawk, the world's strongest swordsman, being the Black Blade Yoru, an incredibly fearsome existence that exudes power every bit as much as its owner. Then there's also Muruku Magiri, a Nagitana previously owned by Whitebeard, aka the strongest man in the world. And no, it's not a sword per se, it's more of a halberd, but it's here anyway. And the final of the supreme great swords swords we know of is the Shodai Kitetsu, which we can't technically confirm that we've ever seen. However, it is highly suspected to be owned by this member of the Gorosei, Samurai Gandhi. And it's thought to be that because it has an extraordinarily similar hilt matching the rest of the Kitetsu set, a series of blades that are all cursed by the way, because that's the thing you can do with swords, which almost always results in making them much more powerful, but it takes a particularly special person to tame and wield them. And in fact, even without being cursed, swords can be quite unruly and many of the great ones have often been referred to as if they have personalities of their own. Something that we would see in action on Wano with a certain spoiler blade. But that's enough about swords. I could probably do a whole video about them and I might do just that in the future. But for now, the One Piece world has a lot more to offer us. And as such, I would like to present something that is quite possibly technically the most powerful weapon in the series being the reject dial. And dials are an often forgotten about aspect of this tale. And to be fair, they are more or less a relic of the pre-time skip era, which is a shame because they hold pretty damn absurd potential potential as we see here. The reject dial is something of an upgrade to the standard impact dial, which absorbs all of the force applied to it and can then release that force back out at the user's discretion, as we saw with Luffy and Usopp on Water 7. However, the reject dial is an entirely new level of power altogether because it absorbs whatever force it encounters and it is then able to send that back at 10 times the level it was absorbed at, which is kind of maddening because as far as we know, it is impossible to destroy a reject dial with any kind of attack. I honestly doubt that even Kaido's Thunder Bagua would break one. Instead, it would absorb the attack and you would be able to release a Thunder Bagua 10 times more powerful than Kaido could ever conjure at whatever unfortunate soul you so chose to target. However, there is one big, big, oh, absolutely massive problem with the reject dial, which is that in wielding this power, it also has a teeny tiny recoil effect on the user. And it has been said that any regular person would probably be killed by simply attempting to use the reject dial. Although Wiper managed to use it three times during the Skypeer arc, the third of which did in fact nearly kill him, although he would have managed to kill Enel if that tricksy god wasn't able to restart his own heart and everything, overpowered Logia. But if you were feeling particularly reckless, then the reject dial is without a doubt one of, and potentially actually the strongest weapon in the series.
provided it has the right input. And topping that immediately is going to be difficult, so we're just going to go into some weird weapons instead with the Battle Frankies. So these were special ships built by Frankie, previously known as Cutty Flam, and they were designed to hunt sea kings, so they pack some pretty serious punch. But even then, the early Battle Frankies were mere prototypes for much greater weapons which can be seen in the ultimate incarnation of Frankie, who is himself a Battle Frankie, with his pre-time skip model being Battle Frankie 36, whilst post-time skip he has upgraded to Battle Frankie 37. And here, Frankie represents the height of cybernetic advancement, overshadowed only by the work of a certain scientist, but in this form, Frankie is capable of insane things like shooting physical projectiles, conjuring lasers, inbuilt rocket launchers, and of course, the all-important nipple lights, which is by far the most powerful asset that Frankie has at his disposal. Also, as a weapon, Frankie's mammoth forearms are not to be underestimated for their blunt force power. And then of course, we also have General Frankie, which is everything I've already mentioned, but in a much bigger package. And General Frankie, fun fact, is also made out of Wapo metal, which is the substance that Wapo got rich off after accidentally creating it. So that's a pretty damn fine series of weapons, but while we are on the topic of cybernetics, we should also bring up the Pacifista, which do represent the most advanced incarnation of cybernetics. Born from the mind of Dr. Vegapunk and cobbled together with the bodily inspiration of Bartholomew Kuma, and there's even a hint of Marine Admiral Kizaru in the mix, because Vegapunk was able to replicate the laser beams that Kizaru's Devil Fruit allows him to conjure. And these things are wildly deadly, which was made painfully clear to us during the Sabadi arc, where it took an entire crew of pre-time skip straw hats just to bring down one of these maddening machinations. In addition to that, this legion of cyborg warriors also proved integral during the Paramount War, managing to flank Whitebeard's allied crew forces and put them in a very bad situation to say the least. Now, having said all of that, as soon as the post-time skip era rolled around, these things weren't all that flash anymore, with Luffy managing to defeat one on his own in a very casual manner, as well as Zoro and Sanji teaming up to swiftly take one down. So as for their status in regards to being some of the most powerful weapons in the world, it's kind of up in the air. Rookie pirates have no chance whatsoever against the Pacifista, but the more experienced New World combatants can deal with them surprisingly easily, calling their general effectiveness very, very much into question. What I cannot call into question, however, is our next set of weapons, which are the raid suits developed by Vin Smoke Judge of the German Kingdom, who I suppose is kind of like the Tony Stark of the One Piece world, having managed to create items that can turn people into literal superheroes. The raid suits feature a whole host of amazing inbuilt tech, including flotation devices on the soles of its boots, allowing flight, which is a benefit that cannot be overstated in the series, given how much of the planet is covered in water. And to assist with this, there are also accelerators on the boot heels, which not only allow for swift maneuverability, but also adds greatly to the impact of kick-based attacks, as we have now seen with Sanji with his utter, utter demolition of page one on Wano. But it doesn't even stop there because each of these funky suits comes with its own individual benefit. For example, Sanji's allows him to turn invisible, something that he has wished to do for the large majority of his life. But another example would be Niji, whose suit allows him to generate and channel electricity. But probably the best part about the raid suits is that they are each biometrically locked meaning that only the intended user can don. But from here, we're going to move on to one of the weapons that fascinates me most in this entire series, which is the Clam Attack. An often underrated piece of gear because Nami isn't given the opportunity to use it a whole lot, but when she does, it is effective to say the least. So the Clam Attack is something of an ultimate fusion of skills within the Straw Hats. It is designed to take advantage of Nami's supreme knowledge of weather, Usopp's creative engineering, and even Frankie's highly advanced scientific knowledge. Although the first two incarnations of the Clam Attack were just Usopp's up a Nami at work, and Frankie came along later to assist in the current version being the Sorcery Climb Attack. And through this, Nami can replicate natural phenomena, including conjuring lightning, crafting mirages, generating clouds of fog, and yeah, almost anything she wants to do in the realm of weather, really. And it only continues to get more and more powerful. And in fact, in combination with Zeus, Nami is actually the wielder of quite possibly the strongest source of raw power amongst the Straw Hats, even managing to get in the most devastating hit we've ever seen a Straw Hat deal to one of the four emperors. One of the only hits in general, actually. But the thing about the climb attack is that it is very individually specialized. No, it's not biometrically locked like the raid suits, but there is no one else in this world who can wield this weapon apart from Nami. It is tailored to her knowledge and skill set, and I have no issues whatsoever with calling it one of the ultimate weapons in One Piece. One of being the operative term there, because there's a pretty big gap between this and the true ultimate weapons of the series, which of course would be the ancient weapons. Now these 
are undisputedly the most powerful weapons in the series, so much so that they've influenced an incredible array of events within it. I mean, Pluton alone was the catalyst that caused both the Alabaster Saga as well as the Water 7 Saga, so a fair few people just might want to get their hands on them. For good reason, I suppose, as the ancient weapon Pluton was said to have the power to sink entire islands, as is Poseidon actually, another of the ancient weapons, which speaking of, Poseidon is embodied within Princess Shirahoshi, allowing her to commune with sea kings and cause unparalleled destruction if she were ever to be in, say, a volatile emotional state, which happens frequently. Meanwhile, Pluton is a more standard weapon that is supposedly a large warship, and there is one other ancient weapon being Uranus, which we have by far the least amount of detail on. That amount of detail being zero, but it is said to be the equal of the other two, and as such, I think we can safely expect some pretty damn serious power from it. In fact, any one of these ancient weapons individually presents us with the ability to completely reshape the world, for better or worse, depending on how they are used. And while they might overshadow everything else in existence, let's just take the time to remember remember that weapons are an integral aspect of One Piece. Not every character needs to draw power from a devil fruit and not every weapon needs to be as useless as a general marine rifle. Weapons at the highest level are pretty serious business, whether they take the form of a sword, a cyborg, a superhero costume, or a world ending apocalyptic device. But what do you guys think? Please leave your thoughts in the comments below or even join my Discord server. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, then please do go and check out some of my other content or even subscribe to the channel for more glorious One Piece business. Upload straight into your YouTube feeds. But for now, this has been the Groundline Review, and I'll see you next time.